set up the iPad here. Okay, so so yeah, the the Jones thing. Jones, I can write things. Okay, Jones taxonomy. That the general statement was so. Okay, so well, first we need to think of what what are we what letter are we using for technology. Um, you know, it could be we we used A for Jones, but but A can be standing in here for N or Q or whatever our parameter is. Okay, so um, let's just call it A though. Uh, so in the general case, we wrote A you know the phi R to the eta, and sort of strongly imply that R is some kind of uh, labor utilization or count of mass of people, okay, uh, researchers. So, um, yeah, so then, uh, but then usually, well, well, oftentimes, uh, let's see, so in um, uh, an expanding varieties, okay, um, it was, you know, and and dot was equal to gamma and basically okay so that was a that was a phi equals one gamma equals one world there um and then in Jupiter um so in Jupiter uh it was well so so q dot was um you know the log of lambda times tau right which is which was the log of lambda times uh gamma times r right so so in the q world uh you know we had like everything things were driven through tau and then when tau happened you know you got this log lambda boost to aggregate q so so we have a little bit more than gamma but it's still just, you know log lambda times gamma is our new gamma so that's our constant right so r and then there's uh oh it's and actually but but because it's proportional you know, the, so that that was the growth rate of Q, but because it's proportional, I guess I, I need a Q here too. Q, right? So the growth rate of Q is log lambda times tau. So then Q dot is Q times that, right? So so actually, this is also a phi equals one uh, gamma. Uh, sorry, eight, that should be an eta when I'm saying gamma equals one. Yeah, that should be eta. Okay, so this is uh, eight. Oh no, what's that? Really? What have I done? Okay. Oh, I wanted to highlight a mode. That's why. Okay. So, uh, eight equals one. So that's that's the proper statement. Okay. So so actually, yeah. That I guess I didn't realize it 100. percent But yeah, those were both phi equals one equals one world. Phi equals one maybe is not going to be surprising because we we knew that if we want to get away with with growth, um, that's or like we knew that that was kind of simpler from the um, from the outset. And then eighty. So so. Phi equals one, we're, we're going to stick with that. Okay, so that's going to be kind of, um, well, I mean, I, I might, there's a possibility that I could deviate from pi equals one. I'm not going to rule anything out. And, and but I, I probably won't. I shouldn't say that, but I probably won't. I mean, I just haven't talked about things outside of the phi equals one world, so I wouldn't want to go too far from that. Okay, um, uh, eight equals one. So eight equals one, um, that, you know, um, uh, that can present some issues because in general, you know, eight equals one gives us the linear, uh, free entry condition, right? So when we get, when we get these free entry conditions, you know, we get, you know, in, if we go, go back to the standard Jones, uh, notation, you know, in the world we're operating in, we have a dot equals gamma times a times r, five equals one, eight equals one, right? And that yields, uh, if you have, um, a value V for that new innovation, then um okay well let's see let me, let me make sure i can make sure you know it's a little bit different in Jupiter because um because um why is it different in Jupiter Maybe it's that. No, maybe it's maybe it's that. So so I guess um Yeah, so I guess in so in Jupiter that Q statement is is sort of like a aggregate social planners perspective. Okay. From the perspective of a firm, you get pi, which goes into V, 
right? Um, but then pi is proportional to y, which is proportional to q. So you still have the proportionality. It's just like in Schumpeter, you're thinking about the, from the perspective of a firm. You're not thinking about things from an aggregate perspective. Okay, so there's a don't you know this 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 these these things are true here, right? But um, they're they're more of like a social planner's you know bird's eye view of what's going on in the economy of sort of just accounting for it and how it moves in the aggregate. Uh, when you think about things in terms of incentives and, and the individual firms, you still need to think from their perspective. Okay, so um, it can be a little confusing, I guess. But but you know, so so for uh, so for Schumpeter, right? So you have you know some probability gamma of success, and then you get that um, value v, and you're you're trading that off with w, right? And then um, let me make sure that I'm using the right notation here for uh, for expanding varieties. So this is shump iter um and then uh for expanding varieties um you're gonna get gamma well, you, get, you get gamma and v equals w okay so then let me so i guess it's like um The, the intuition, it, it's a little weird because the N shows up in ex expanding varieties, but then the, the Q doesn't show up on the Schumpeter one. Um, and I guess it's really because the, I think this is why I'm sorry, I'm like confusing myself here too, but um, Schumpeter, the thing that happens is a proportional event, right? You're improving an existing product line by a, a proportional factor lambda. The thing that happens in expanding varieties is you create one infinitesimal new product line. Okay, so because you're just you're you're like a derivative in expanding varieties, but you're a you're a growth rate. You're you're already kind of a growth rate in Schumpeter because you're doing a proportional improvement, right? Whereas and when you create a new product, that's just n dot. When you create a new product, when you improve a product line, that's sort of like lambda times some average q, right? Or some some random choice of, of a q out there, right? So um, that's why you need to boost up expanding varieties by the n factor and say, oh, well, there's this technology around that makes producing new technology easier. You need to boost it up by n because you need, you want this equation to balance out, right? Because we know that w is growing uh, with, um, let's see. So, so yeah, we know that we know that w is growing with output, okay? Because w is, that's people's wage and that, that basically determines their consumption in this world um, or in, in conjunction with profits and everything. Um, and so W is like sort of an output scale thing, okay? In Schumpeter, okay, um, V is proportional to pi, which is proportional to Y. Remember, so Schumpeter, it's like one minus lambda inverse times Y is your profit. So profit is already proportional to Y, okay? Uh, and hence that, that equation balances out. So V is kind of Y-like, W is Y-like, the equation balances out. Uh, with expanding varieties, um, so V, is is not proportional to y exactly i guess it's proportional to um y over n okay and so you throw on that extra n right and then you get that because because expanding varieties you, you you have a profit share and you're splitting that between more and more product lines right so you have y your, your output um your profit share is some fraction of y okay so it's profit share is y like but then you're splitting between an increasingly large number of product lines so you're diluting that, right? So that's that's why it's a y over n type thing. You throw on the n, all of a sudden n times v is is a uh, is a y like thing, and w is a y like thing. Okay, so so what drive? So to to get back to your your kind of the your original question, Gary, is what drives it is? I mean, it's it's kind of the Jones stuff. Okay, just think about what, but it's it's really the production function for ideas, which isn't always just a simple equation. It's it's a setup, I guess. Um, and there's some variations there, but then it really it is a production function for ideas but then in terms of like checking it after you've written it down like does this make sense just kind of try and get an idea for do things balance out in growth rate terms on each side because you do you you want that right if that's not happening then things are going to get wacky and probably we're not going to we, we want to stay in, in a world where, where these things are balanced yeah okay Uh, we imposed that. Yeah. So we, we imposed, 
yeah 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 so so yeah i mean it, it yeah we, we both discovered it and opposed it in the sense that we imposed that you can freely choose between those two things without cost and sort of an immediate implication of that is is the the wages will be the same basically yeah okay uh any other questions all right okay um let's 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 do this okay i'm gonna do a problem it's not it, it, you can you can it, it's really just a model okay but but you can imagine how I, I would set up the problem okay and i'll just I'll, I'll walk you through how i would set up the problem and what i would tell you like here here's what you can use here's stuff i'm just going to tell you like here's the approach you should take versus figure it out right so so usually i'll, I'll tell you kind of the, the outline of how to approach something and not just be like you know just i'm not just going to throw you in the pool right so um yeah your thing mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yep um you you that that would be uh kind of in the aggregate that would look like eta less than one so so you you, you oftentimes I, I forget what what i think one of my friends in grad school is doing a model like this but um you know you can imagine okay order everyone in the world or the economy or whatever by their um propensity to do research right and and let's say that it looks like um so so if everyone had the same propensity it would be a, it would be a flat line right but then maybe you imagine that you know there's some uh ordering so, so so what we're doing here is we're basically ordering people by their uh uh propensity to do research so this this zero person just doesn't like or can't do research at all okay and then um the people up towards one just can't for whatever reason okay so we're not really taking a stance on why this is but this is just the way it is um and so in that world you know, you, 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 if you had our researchers, okay, well, you know, this distance would be our basically, okay. So you, you'd presume that the, the most apt people to be researchers would be the ones that would do it. If, if you conditional on a certain uh, fraction, so I guess this point would be one minus R, right. Um, and so, so that's the number of researchers, but then if you look at the total output, um, you know, so, so the total output is going to, you know, the, so the total research output is going to be this area here, right? Um, I might have done this backwards, but by, by starting from one, but, but so, so the, the most productive people are going to start there. And as, as you increase R, you are going to, oh, of course, always get more research, but you're, you're, it's going to be a concave function. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, so, so, you, and then by assuming a functional form for this curve, you control the concavity of, of that function and hence basically eta. Yeah. So, so that, that's a common way to, to sort of micro found, uh, an eta less than one. Yeah. Um, but actually I, I, I had been meaning to talk about eta not being one too. So let me, let me just use this opportunity to talk about that for a second, because that does it, eta less than one, you know, it, it forget about the micro founding for a second, just say it just, that's how it is. Um, you know, eta less than one, Maybe, well, maybe, maybe the message is we can't forget about the microfinding because here, when we have eight equals one, uh, you know, thinking about the marginal person is, is kind of the same as thinking about the aggregate or like every person, every marginal person, regardless of their sort of identity has the same problem. Whereas, you know, if you think about this world here, you know, when you think about the marginal person, you kind of need to know, oops, uh, which person they are because then you need to know their sort of propensity for research, and then you can make that marginal entry decision, right? Uh, in the world, you know, the, the flat world, right? The marginal entry decision is the same for everyone. You don't have to know R to think about that marginal entry decision, okay? So, so, um, so, so in the, but in this, this world with variation, okay, you need to say, okay, well, if, if you had some R star, okay, then um, there's, there's some, you know, gamma of that, marginal person okay and that marginal person 
uh, let's say we're in a Schumpeterian world, you know, would think, okay, my for my gamma, okay, if I get v, that should be equal to w, right? So, so this the basically gamma would be a function because it depends on like which person is the marginal person, but that marginal person by the definition of being the marginal person should be indifferent between being a researcher and being a worker. Anyone that's sort of more apt to be a researcher will will then strictly prefer to be a researcher and anyone less apt will strictly prefer to be a worker. Okay, so so this would be your new thing here. Okay, and um, and so that that gamma though, uh, you know, as R star gets bigger, uh, uh, gamma goes down. Okay, so um, so then uh, so 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 basically, like your your average. Yeah, so so as our star goes bigger, gamma goes down, right? You're less like as, as there are more researchers, you're you're dipping into sort of people that are less apt or able to do research. Okay, so your productivity of research goes down. Okay, so so that that that'll sort of change up your your uh, it, it'll make your your friendship condition a little bit more complicated, potentially substantially more complicated actually. So that's kind of why we we, we don't do that usually. Yeah. Uh, but then you can map that you can then map that back up to a Jones style aggregate description of of the world um, by 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 doing the integral basically so yeah okay so all right so that that's gamma that's gamma not less than one i mean the, usually we think the the prop the usual direction go less than one uh uh it's it's interesting um but it's a little more complicated it kind of makes our lives uh makes our lives harder um Okay, so, all right, I'm gonna, anything else? We're good? All right. Um, okay, so we're, we're gonna have this question. Uh, it's actually, um, it's not too wild, okay? It, it's really just, we have Schumpeter and we have expanding varieties, and those are kind of, in some sense, you know, what we changed was kind of two things. Uh, so we started with expanding varieties, but we had this epsilon aggregator, and the the goal, or so the 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 the, um, the dynamic was that you increase the number of varieties, and that that leads to growth. Okay, and that's what people are doing when they do research; they they create a new variety. Uh, then we jumped over to Schumpeter, where the goal or the the name of the game was to uh, with a fixed uh, set of product lines to just improve those in terms of their um, uh, productivity. Remember, so this is like y equals q times l. Y equals Q times L is that, that's Schumpeter, right? So you, you 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 do this research, you improve Q for that product line, and then th that happens um, at, at scale, right? Uh, with expanding varieties, we just had Y equals L, right? So you just, it was just unit productivity and that was it, you just got more product lines, okay? So that was the jump. In doing that jump, we also jumped from epsilon being greater than one to epsilon being equal to one, basically, which is that the log log aggregation, okay? So we also sort of, just because it kind of made our lives easier, um, switched over. We simultaneously switched uh, the, the mechanism of growth and also um, a property of the, the aggregate production function. Okay, so that's why I'm saying that those are sort of two of the the, the off the, the diagonal squares of this model space. Okay, um, so yeah. So what I want to do now is Schumpeter, but with epsilon greater than one potentially. Okay, so we're we're ditching the log log, but we're still doing Jupiter. Okay, so that's that's the goal. It, it'll reveal, I think, you know, some. It, it's a little bit trickier. Okay, but not, not too much more. But it, it'll show. I think it'll show you kind of sort of potential pitfalls, some regularities that we you usually expect to see. Okay, and then just sort of the process for for a new type of, of model, but one that's basically familiar to us. We've done every component. We just haven't done these components in this configuration. Okay. Um, all right, so that that's the plan, okay? And so, um, you know, we're going to solve the production, solving the production system, you know, in some way, okay? That's going to be kind of your part A, maybe part A and B, okay? And then, you know, kind of, for, you know, finding the growth rate for entry, all that stuff is going to be C and D kind of thing, okay? That would that would be the general layout of the problem, okay? Um, all right, so then, but but what we're dealing with is. Um, Okay, so so this is still a Schumpeterian model, basically though. It's just a Schumpeterian model with a different production function. Okay, um, 
All right, so so our production function is, I guess, um, you know, so usually, you know, in the notes and everything, um, I wrote it like this. Okay, so so let's let's draw a line here. Okay, and then so we're gonna have a Jupiterian model with with a unit mass of products. Okay, so we're not expanding varieties anymore. Um, and then we're taking each of those y's. Doing that thing, and then undoing that thing after the integral. Okay, um, so that's the production function. Okay, um, and then you know for each y, then if, you know because we need some way to improve things, we're going to be improving their productivity. Okay, so it's y times y equals q times l. Okay, uh, sometimes it's also useful. You know the way I used to write that log log aggregator. It's useful to write it like this. To say that it's a it's an epsilon thing epsilon thing aggregator okay um, mm -hmm. that's why that's why because uh, yeah this is the CES this is this is a, a continuum generalization of the CES uh, Cobb Douglas result basically yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and yeah, so 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 why but the the why production function up top, you know, it's kind of returns to scale, all the all that good stuff, right? So, um, but but yeah, but, you know, so but you know, like with the log log, you know, you you could write it y equals exponential of integral of log, but if you move it over, then it's log log here. Now it's epsilon fraction power is the integral of all the epsilon fraction powers. Okay, um, okay. The the second one is is useful sometimes if we're when we're going to be like integrating stuff to to like get back aggregate consistency is going to be just like useful to know that too. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I think this is, you know, we could plug in this if we want. It's not going to get us that much because we don't know about the correlation between Q and L. Okay. So, so the, the correlation between Q and L, you know, if L was constant, then yeah, that, that'll make our lives easier. But if it's not, which it's not going to be, then things are more complicated. Okay. So, uh, we're, that's that's the best we can do for now. Okay, so this is production. Okay, um, let me let me get the assumptions out so we so we know what's happening. Uh, and then the research side is going to be well, that's going to be actually the same. Okay, it's going to be the same. Uh, there's going to be one wrinkle is that we're we're losing symmetry. Okay, so before all the products, all the product lines look the same, and we're just like, oh, we, we do an innovation of size lambda because it's always size lambda, and we get a, a very, you know, deterministic profit level regardless of which product line it sort of lands on. Okay, so it didn't really matter that it was random. Okay, but now, you know, we're we're going to do innovation. We succeed. We just sort of like a random. It's like, oh, I did some innovation and I invented a new type of peanut butter and jelly. It could have been that I invented a new type of microprocessor, but it just happened to be a new new type of PB and J sandwich, right? So. Uh, that's not really how innovation works, of course, but um, that's a simplifying assumption. Okay, so uh, maybe you could think like nar more narrowly in scope a little bit. But um, so so it is going to be important that you you get a random product line because not all the product lines are going to look different. So we're going to take an expectation over that. Okay. Um, okay. So that but the but the research production function everything like that's going to look the free entry condition that's not going to look the same. Uh, exit like kind of in the abstract. Okay. So. Um, Okay, so now we can we can work through this. All right, so we already kind of know we know like stuff that we've already derived. I'm gonna kind of take as given. Okay, so we've already done <clears throat> like what's demand uh, for for this production function. What's the you know? So we think about if you wanted, to, but you know, in general, if you wanted to find the the, the demand function, you'd say well, pi. The, the final good producing firm is doing some optimization. They take the PI as given and they say, how much Y do I want to buy? And so they, what that means, basically, if you write it out, they're going to buy Y until that marginal product is equal to P because the marginal, sorry, marginal revenue, which is actually the marginal product, is equal to marginal cost, which is P. Okay, so this is like a del Y, del Y I. Okay, so that's like their optimality constraint, but it's also like, you know, Price equals marginal cost, standard stuff. Okay, so um, <clears throat> or marginal product. So um, uh, yeah, and then this 
derivative here, okay, we, we did this before, but basically it's going to look like, you know, y over yi raised to the, let me make sure I get this right. Computer epsilon over one, one, minus, one over epsilon. Impossible to say, Sandy, which one it is. Which one it is? One over epsilon. Because, well, okay. Yeah, I mean, so, so and the, the logic is you take this derivative and you subtract one power. So epsilon over epsilon minus one ends up being one over epsilon minus one, which is that thing to the one over epsilon. Okay, so that's why we have a one over epsilon here. Okay, we because we already derived it, I'm not gonna go through the algebra and I'll, cause I, I also need to like finish this problem in finite time. Okay, but you know, go, you know, if, if, that, that, if that doesn't ring a bell, you know, just go back and, and it, you know, to the lectures we, we, we derive that, okay? Um, so this is the, the inverse demand function, okay? So this is telling you price as a function of quant of quantity yi, okay? Um, and then we can we can invert this to find the inverse inverse demand function, for which there is no other name, okay? Uh, but if you want, you can call it the demand function. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's going to be if you invert that. Well, first of all, if you invert it, you should be getting yi. Um, uh, you're going to get pi the minus epsilon times y. Okay, so now this is kind of, maybe you can think about it from the perspective of the intermediate firm saying, I, if I choose the price PI, here's how, how much I'm going to sell. Okay. Um, all right. And it's just that minus epsilon is your price elasticity or your, your demand elasticity. Okay. Um, okay. So, so that's, that's sort of, you know, step one, get your aggregate, the, your, your aggregator, get your, your demand function from the sort of coming from the perspective of the final good aggregator then step into the, the shoes of the intermediate good producer. If they're wearing shoes, I'm not wearing shoes. Uh, why should I be wearing shoes? Um, you know, step into their, their, their shoes or whatever they're wearing on their feet, if anything, and think about their optimization problem. Okay. And that is where we can invoke kind of what we found before, which is like, we, we got this sort of slightly general result. I don't want to be too grandiose here, but we had a slightly general result of, if you're facing uh, a sort of demand function as an intermediate producer with a certain elasticity, you're going to set a certain price markup over cost, right? So we, 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 we did, we did, you know, we wrote out the pi i, right? For some general uh, demand function, you know, P of Y. Um, and then we, we just found this sort of elasticity result. Okay. Um, and what that's going to give you, Okay. Well, so, so what that gave us was, uh, that PI. So if, if epsilon, you know, that's your elasticity of, of demand. Okay. It's going to be, you know, this fraction times your, your marginal cost, right? So your price markup over marginal cost, right? And so we found that, uh, so first of all, this is, you know, epsilon over epsilon minus one is greater than one. Okay, because the numerator is, the, the denominator is, is less than the numerator. It's greater than one. Um, you know, that's where we saw when epsilon goes to, to one, things go a little haywire, right? In fact, that, that fraction goes to infinity, okay? Because you're just gonna charge an infinite price. Um, uh, and then as epsilon gets large, you know, you converge to linear uh, production function, linear, linear aggregation function. Everyone's perfectly substitutable. No one has any market power, so they're going to charge cost. They're going to charge price equals cost, marginal cost. Okay, so so this is the that sort of a, a slightly general result. If if you're facing this this you know uh, demand function with elasticity uh, uh, epsilon or minus epsilon technically, so um, you're just going to charge a, a constant markup over cost. Now, in this world, remember this is our this is our production function. Before with expanding varieties, this the 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 uh, intermediate production function was y equals l. Now we have a q going on, right? So before we just had w there for marginal cost, but now we're going to have w over qi. Okay, as so qi is your productivity. It's a little backwards, but qi is your productivity. So so that pushes down your marginal cost. You still have to pay the wage, right? But but the higher your qi, the less the lower your marginal cost is. Okay, so this is this is going to be your price. All right. Um, 
Okay, so so now we know what price they're charging. Okay, as a function of the wage, which is just some equilibrium price for now. Okay, and then their own QI. All right, and uh, yeah, so they're they're going to charge a, a because they're mark, doing constant markup over cost. They're charging a lower price if they have higher productivity. Okay. Um. Yeah, and if they if they charge a lower price, they're going to sell more too. So their YI is going to be higher. Okay, so, so I guess the next thing we can do is is uh, map that that PI that we found into YI using the uh, demand function, basically. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's going to give us YI being what well, it's that thing to the minus epsilon. Okay, so I'm I'm going to flip it and then raise it to the epsilon because that's how I roll. All right, and then we still got Y here. All right, so now we know how much they're producing. And, and there's this funny situation, okay, where it's like I'm producing YI as a function of well, my QI, that makes sense. The wage, my input cost, that makes sense. But then like whatever it else is doing. So it's like, oh, you're producing a lot? I'm gonna produce a lot too, for some reason. Um, it's a little, it, it doesn't seem to make sense. And also there's this sort of recursivity because Y technically includes yi but since yi is infinitesimally small it doesn't really cause big issues okay um but there is sort of a, a consistency notion that you could impose here right because it's saying okay everyone else is producing aggregate y therefore i'll produce yi but then y is a product of all the yi's aggregated so there, there's a consistency condition you could add in on top of that by plugging this into that uh yi i wish i could like point at stuff outside of my my box but I'm, i can't do that like if there's some like machine learning plugin where like i just became like mr fantastic and i could just like i, I could use my mouse i guess but why would i I, w I want like my arm to like be animated there but but it's not gonna happen um so uh yeah so so there's another condition and, and here okay so so at this point right we kind of we've we've exploited the the pricing rule, okay, we plugged it into the demand function, we know P and Y, okay? We could plug in for, uh, we could find, ultimately we wanna find profit because we wanna find value and plug that into the free entry condition, okay? So just, that's that's where we're going, okay? But there's still stuff that we kind of don't know, okay? So at this point, you probably wanna say, okay, well, let's get our house in order on P and Y here, and then we can move on to finding profits. Okay, there's always a question of like, what do you do next? What conditions are on the table for you to impose to make your, your life like hopefully easier? Um, uh, so at this point, okay, I'm gonna say, let's let's impose aggregate consistency of YI. Let's plug it back into the aggregate production function and, and get a condition, okay? And the weird thing though, is that there's basically two aggregate consistency conditions in any of these types of models at this stage is the, 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 the final good aggregator, Y. Okay, does it, given the sort of recursive YI depends on Y, does it all make sense? And we'll see it will. That gives you a condition. And then also the, the labor market, right? That, that the integral of LI adds up to, to P, whatever P is in this case. Okay, so but we're always gonna take P as given, P equals one minus R as given at this point in time and then solve for that that split later in the aggregate. Okay, so, but those are, you, you have your final good and your, your labor market conditions. Those are on the table almost always, okay? The funny thing here though, is that when we plug in for the final good condition, we're gonna get the wage. And then when we plug in for the labor market condition, we're gonna get output. So for somehow, somehow the wires get crossed and we get the wage from the final good and output from the production, from the uh, labor market condition. I don't know, it, I mean, it, it I don't have a deep reason for that, why why they why it's sort of backwards, but but it often is. Okay. Um so just do both. And and you'll get both at, at the end. Okay. So um all right, so so we're gonna we're gonna basically impose Y consistency. We're gonna impose P as in production, you know, uh P equals one minus R consistency, right? Uh and that's gonna give us sort of jointly uh, the wage and an actual value for y. Okay. That's the plan. All right. Um, so let's do that.
Okay. Uh, yeah. I'm going to hyaw here. I'm going to hyaw that's why I. I'd like to copy you. All right, cool. All right, uh, next page. All right, there we go. Okay, so we want to um, plug that into our aggregate production function. Okay, so so to to do that, okay, so we're going to get, um, remember the aggregate production function, it was this epsilon fraction powered y is equal to the integral of all the yi's raised to that same epsilon fraction power okay um so what that what that's going to give us well you can see if, if you apply the power epsilon of epsilon minus one over epsilon to the to the yi above it's just going to replace that epsilon with an epsilon minus one and then integrate it okay so we're going to get like the integral of this whole thing here so epsilon times epsilon minus one over epsilon which is just Epsilon minus one, okay. Uh, di, and I, I'm gonna, and I guess the the yi is just gonna be out there as a epsilon minus one, okay. So in this, so this is like separate here, All right? So the, I mean the yi, I, I just sort of factored out, okay. So um, and the re sorry, the reason I can factor it out is, well, the integral. I mean, it, it's it's not a function of i, so I can just factor it out at the integral, okay. So first of all, um. Uh, these y's are going to just, can't, they just cancel. That's it. They're out. All right. Sort of surprisingly, I guess. Um, and then, uh, okay, and then now the, the w and the epsilon fraction thing, th those are not i varying. We can we can move those out. And, and let's just move those. Well, let's let's move the w to the other side. So, so we're going to get like w equals something. We're going to factor out this epsilon fraction. And what we're left with is this Q integral. Okay, the QI to the epsilon minus one integral. All right, so it's some aggregation of QI. All right, um, we have we have seen aggregations of QI before. I think the I mean the log log aggregation of QI, right? So so the it mirrored you know whatever our product our aggregate production function was. So now here. We're going to have a different Q aggregator. Okay. And so um, I'm going to make sure this is right. Yeah. So, so as, as a part of the problem, I would tell you, maybe I should have said this earlier. I'm gonna, I'll just tell you, here, here's what your Q aggregator is going to be. Okay. And in this case, your Q aggregator is going to be this type of thing. Okay. Which, which is, you know, equivalent to uh, you know, saying Q is this integral, right? The some kind of CRS Q aggregation here. Okay. So, um, and I'll write it in the second form because that's often going to be easier. For instance, on the left, I can just sub in Q to the epsilon minus one, right? So, but it's this, this I'll say, okay, this is your Q aggregator uh, in, as part of the problem. Uh, cause I don't want to, I want, I want to have sort of waypoints that you can keep keep things on, on track if, if there are variations. Okay, so um, so th so that'll be our Q aggregator. Okay, and then the other thing we're going to do is that's aggregating all those Qs together. The other thing we, we is useful to do here is to define like a relative Q, which is going to be QI over that Q aggregator. Okay, so now we're saying, well, you have some productivity. That leads, when you aggregate all those up, that leads to some aggregate Q. But you can also think about where are you sort of relative to that distribution. Okay. And, and, and it's important that, that, that Q thing though, the Q aggregator is, it's like a CRS type thing, right? If you double all the Qs, QI, you double Q and everything like that. So, so this fraction is, is sort of the right way to go. Okay. We don't need epsilons in there. It's just, it's just, it's just a fraction. Okay. Okay. So that's our Q aggregator. And then from that, you know, once we sort of have that in our pocket, then we can just say, well, this is the wage is epsilon minus one of epsilon times Q. Okay, because that that integral, you know, just use that the right hand side equation. It's, sorry, I've I've made some mistakes here. I made a mistake here. 
which is that I kill I accidentally killed off the epsilon powers. It's it's a it's a mistake that I want to make. Or no, I want to not make the mistake, which I'm going to do now. These these should have epsilon powers on them. Okay? Because when I factored those when I factored these out here, I should have brought this epsilon minus 1 with them, right? Which is good because this q also has an epsilon power. Okay? So the thing I did there was make two mistakes that canceled each other out, so I got to the right answer, but I'm actually just going to do it the right way. So those things, when I factor them out, get that epsilon minus one power. This thing becomes a Q to the epsilon minus one uh, because of this equation here, this definition of Q. Now we just have this equation. Well, you know, everything is, is raised to that power. So now we get just this, we just cancel off all those powers. Okay. So I, I the epsilon has to be greater than one strictly, but um, okay. So that's what we get. So that's why I was saying you 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 go for aggregate consistency of production and you get a wage, okay? And the wage is, is basically, um, uh, so so basically Q is going to be the marginal product of labor, okay? So the wage is 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 uh, some fraction less than one of the marginal product of labor, okay? The the remaining fraction essentially goes to profits, okay? So this is this 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 is the inklings of a labor share equation. Okay, but in the sense that it's defining a wage. Okay, that's that's a function of productivities. Okay. Um, all right, but th this is useful. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and, and so now the next thing we can do, okay, so we, we, we oops, I'm, no, I'm scared that. We have the wage, okay, and let me just jump up here real quick. It, we can plug that back into this equation here. And it's actually going to make this substantially simpler. Okay. So let me, I'm just going to partially obscure that equation for a moment, but, but if we plug that back in, so we plug in W equals epsilon minus one over epsilon times Q, that's going to kill off the epsilon's fractions here. It's actually just going to, they're going to cancel. So we're going to get YI is um, UI over Q to the epsilon times y, which is which is what we defined here as qi hat. That's y. Okay. So, uh, or, you know, or if you want to think about it like this, you know, your yi over y, your sort of relative y is your relative q raised to the epsilon. Okay. So the higher your product, so like, yeah, the higher your productivity um, relative to everyone else, the higher your output is going to be relative to everyone else. Okay. Um, all right. So that was aggregate cons consistency number one. Okay. And then the other thing is the labor market. Okay. So you know, we, we had PNY. We did the final good consistency. Now we're going to do labor market clearing, basically. Okay. And that's going to give us... That's actually going to give us y, in the, because that's the that's sort of the last thing we don't know. We know the wage now, we just don't know total output. We know relative output, and and the thing is, if I took this and plugged it back into the aggregate consistency equation, it would just it would be like an identity. It would just give me back like one equals one, because this whole thing was derived from that equation, right? So so you might be tempted to say, okay, I can just I can find y by doing a consistency. Well. You're going to plug it back in and you're going to get, <clears throat> well, you're going to get an integral of Q hat to the epsilon minus one, which is, which is by definition going to be one. Okay. So, so there's no more to get out of that equation. Okay. We need to use the labor market equation, clearing equation. All right. So, okay. So, um, let me make sure I do this right. Okay. All right. Um, Here's how we're gonna do it. So we know we know yi now. At least kind of up to scale factor y. Okay. We know also how to get li. We just divide by qi, right? So so li is yi over qi. That's our production function, just inverted. Okay. So if we know yi, maybe we can just throw in this q and kind of figure out li in some reasonable form. Okay, so so that's going to be, um, you know, Q hat I to the epsilon Q 
Okay, oh, over QI times Y. All right, so that's plugging in for that, that Y up there. Now we have a Q hat and a Q. We, they're not exactly the same, okay? But what we can do is that, well, Q is just Q hat times capital Q, right? Basically this here. That QI is just Q hat times capital Q. You sort of undo the normalization to get to your raw QI. So we can do that, and then we have a Y here. Uh, and so that means basically if you combine those, you're gonna get Q hat I to the epsilon minus one times Y over Q. Okay. So on the left, Li here, and then all the way over there, Q, Q hat um, to the epsilon minus one times Y over Q. All right. So we have, you know, let me just, and let me just rewrite this so we have here. Um, we have this, okay. And we can, so, so the thing is, <clears throat> um, we can integrate that. Um, and, and, and in fact, when we integrate that, this is gonna be, the integral of this Q hat thing to the epsilon minus one is just gonna be one. It's gonna be one. Um, you can write it out to see that. So, so this is Q hat to the epsilon minus, QI to the epsilon minus one over Q to the epsilon minus one. Q. Right. If you, just, if you just plug in for Q hat is Q I over capital Q. When you integrate that on the top, you're going to get capital Q to the epsilon minus one. The bottom is just going to cancel that. Okay. So, so by construction kind of, um, you know, the, this integral here, because it's sort of a relative thing, it's just equal to one. Okay because we constructed Q with that exact same power, when you integrate it with that power, you just get one, okay? Or alternatively, if you think there's a, a capital Q inside here, you could just move that over and get the definition of Q back, move it over here and get the definition of Q back, okay? So so when you integrate this, that means that P, which is the integral of, of all those LIs, is just gonna be Y over Q, because that Q hat term is gonna integrate, this Q hat term is gonna integrate to one, so you're just left with Y over Q, and that means that y is equal to q times p. Okay. Remarkably simple for all of that. Y, you know, is is the amount of production labor in total times q, which is sort of your productivity, your aggregate productivity index. Okay. Um, yeah, and so so from here, you know, you can you can actually say exactly what output is, or what what like yi. You can say yi is q hat i to the epsilon times y, which is q times p. Okay, so you can concretely say what you know output is at the, the product line level. Okay, so that's all that's all great, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so 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 we basically we know it all. We we know the wage, we know output. Okay, we know all the yi's and everything. Okay, um, and then the kind of the the now we're ready to move forward to the Frenchy condition. Okay. And um, so yeah, we got we got some time here. Um, so, Branchy, but you know we're gonna have to find profits first, I guess. But we can do that. All right. Um, okay. And yeah, but at this point, I mean, you know, I think knowing how to work through the production system is useful. Okay, and and it really. It's just knowing what's at your disposal, right? You can, you can pretend, oftentimes you're gonna have some sort of aggregate production consistency equation and you have labor market clearing, okay? And that's gonna clear up issues with Y and W, hopefully, all right? Um, and then also knowing, okay, you have the process of finding demand function, using that elasticity result, which is almost always gonna be useful. And, and in the exam, if you wanted to say, we showed here's how uh, a monopolist would, would optimally set their price in the presence of a, a constant elasticity demand. Therefore, you know, 
this, right? So so we can we can invoke results like that from the notes if you want. Okay. Or you can just do your do it by hand if you want. If if you don't if you don't believe that result or if you you don't you don't think you're not sure if it's applicable or something like that, you can just you can always just do it by hand, right? Um okay, so so what is profit? Um well, uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess there is one more thing we need, which is which is price. Okay, so but that's not that hard. So just as sort of a little side here. So remember, we found that price was right. What was pi? Um, Epsilon over epsilon minus one times W over QI. Okay. Um, all right. And actually, this this is what we found before, right? That it's a, some markup over marginal cost. Now, we know wage now. Remember, the wage is epsilon over epsilon minus one over epsilon times Q. And you can see, you, you again, you kind of cancel out those annoying epsilon powers. If you plug it in, you're just going to get Q over Q hat, or sorry, Q over QI which is just, you know, Q hat I inverse, right? So the, the once you use that Q hat notation, the price is just one over Q hat. Okay, so so really one way to think, you know, um, when we think about it, it's, you know, Q hat is, is a measure of your, um, your marginal uh, cost, okay? So your, so your marginal productivity, okay? And and, uh, it, and and sort of because wage is proportional to Q, those those two things end up looking similar. Okay, so um, so PI is equal to Q hat inverse. Okay, all right, and so then from this we can we can find profit. Okay, could because profit is PI YI minus W LI, right? Okay. Um, and then I guess what's the best way to do this? Uh, yeah, so remember we found, so, you know, so this equation here, you know, this this started from, you know, yi is q hat i to the epsilon times y. Okay, so we know p is q hat i to the minus one. We know that y is q hat i to the epsilon times y. Okay, so we have that. And then uh, here, so this is um, w li. We didn't, uh, we, we found li uh, here, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we can, you know, we can plug in for this. Li here, okay. So we're gonna get um, W times Li, which is Q hat I epsilon minus one times Y over Q. All right, so that's looks fairly complicated, okay. But we can we can plug in for the wage, okay, and do some simplification. So we're gonna get you know Q hat I to the epsilon minus one times Y if we combine those two Q hat I terms. Uh, the wage, basically W over Q. Okay, W over Q is going to be epsilon minus one over epsilon. Okay, just sort of plugging in for for the for wage and canceling out that Q. All right, and then you're going to get um, Q hat I to the epsilon minus one times Y. Okay, so you can see like, you know, things kind of line up. Okay, so now we have a Q hat I the epsilon minus one y that's common to both. And it's just sort of accounting for that um, uh, epsilon term. Okay, and, and if you know, you're gonna get one minus epsilon minus one over epsilon, which it turns out if, if you just do the, the sort of combining the fraction, it actually ends up just being one over epsilon. Okay, so one over epsilon q hat i to the epsilon minus one times y. Okay, so that's that's pi i. Okay. Um, all right. So, so, so now we really, we, you know, we have, 
we have pi, okay. Um, that's right. Okay, so then uh, now we can really start moving into the, the proper parameter condition, okay. Um, now, uh, you know, from here, right, we know, so, you know, this is a Schumpeterian world, okay, and, and basically before, you know, we found, you know, something like this. Right, when we when we do the 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 value function stuff, you know, R V I minus V dot equals pi I minus tau. Well, okay. I'll just write it. R V I minus V I dot is pi I minus tau V I. Right. So that's our, our equation of the standard left hand side here, standard left hand side flow value minus just getting booted out in the Schumpeterian sense. Okay. You rearrange that, kind of cleverly divide by the I, rearrange it, and you're going to get back to this. Okay. So th this is kind of always going to be true for a Schumpeterian type model like this, where your you're sort of only event that can happen outside of the usual flow profits is tau. It just goes into your effective discount rate. Okay. So now the issue though is, is GV sometimes is more or less complicated in, uh, the, the, the standard Schumpeterian, the log log Schumpeterian world, GV was G pi. GV is G pi still because, uh, you know, this, this equation basically says that GV is going to be equal to G pi. In the, in the old world, G pi was also G Y, right? Because we, we had a Y out front. So that you might think, okay, that's going to be true here, right? Because this is a normalized quantity. And so we just get Y driving the growth of V of pi and hence V. Okay. But there still is a Q inside, a capital Q inside here. Okay. So the logic is, um, Q hat is a rel it's your relative productivity, basically. Q hat is your relative productivity. So in, in this world, but, but an innovation is still a discrete event, okay, for a particular product line. It's, it happens every so often randomly with the Poisson process. Um, but in this, so so for a given product line, though, in this world, you're basically you're getting your relative productivity is just dragging down. And every so often, there's an innovation, right? And then it gets dragged down because the mean is always going up, right? So you're you're kind you're kind of stochastically catching up, but it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen continuously. Now, conditional on being a, an active producer, actually, your your whole your whole product cycle is you innovate. You, you just sort of like degrade over time relative to the mean, and then you get booted out. Okay. That as an individual firm, because you get replaced, right? Now, if you, if you look at it from the perspective of a product line, okay, you, you get dragged down relative to the mean, then someone innovates, and then you go down, then someone innovates. Okay. So that's at the micro level. That's what's happening. When you aggregate it up, it just looks like even Q growth, right? Because it's a continuum, right? Uh, but at the micro level, you know, you are getting dragged down and you bump back up. So, so there actually is that dragging down from capital Q is, should be accounted for in GV as well. Okay. Um, but that's, that's not, I mean, it, it's, it's just, you know, Q to the epsilon minus one. And, and if, so Q is growing at rate G, you get like a minus epsilon minus one times G factor there as well. Okay. So, so I guess what I'm saying is, uh, I got room here. Yeah. Okay. So then, and then finally GV. So GV is going to be, well, you're going to have some G growth from Y. Okay. Remember Y should have the same growth rate as Q because that's your productivity, your labor productivity minus epsilon minus one times G, which is, so G is growth rate of Q. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and so therefore, you know, R minus GV is going to be Epsilon minus one times G plus rho. So don't want to forget about rho. Okay. So, and there you can see, remember in the, in the log, I know I'm like going way out in the corner here, but in the log log world, we just got R minus GV was rho because that was like an epsilon one world. Okay. But now outside of the epsilon one world, you get, you get extra terms that kind of, they're not going to derail the train. They just add a little bit of complexity. Okay. So. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. So then let's, 
I know I'm really cruising along here, but um, we don't have that much time. Okay, so at the end of the day, this this is going to look like rho plus tau plus epsilon minus one times g. Okay. Um, all right. Now there is one thing that I forgot, which is another slight difference that shows up here. Okay. Um, and, and how exactly this, this plays out isn't so important. It's just being aware that sometimes things work a little differently. Okay. When you, when you, when you tweak things about the model, um, in the world with, uh, uh, so remember pi i, we found pi i was one over epsilon times q hat i, q hat i to the epsilon minus one times y. That was, that was our, our pi i. Now remember in, in the, uh, in the world with Schumpeterian growth with log log aggregation, you just had a lambda, which is constant and that determined your profit. Okay. Now, like I was saying before, you, 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 you're, you always were choosing a random product line. It's just that they were all the same before. Now they're different. Okay. They have different QIs, right? So you, you're taking an expectation over that. Okay. The good thing is that we know that this expectation is actually just one. This integral is just one. Okay. So, so it's reasonable to think that that expectation is one over epsilon times y. And it, it is, but there's one more thing, one more thing, which is that you choose a random, you get a random QI, okay? But then you actually improve it by a factor lambda, okay? So so it it really, I should write like, you know, um, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's sort of like lambda pi plus, post-innovation pi, okay? So pi plus, you know, it's like one over epsilon times, uh, you know, lambda, Q hat i, so minus one times y. Okay, so you increment, you you choose a random product line from that distribution over Q i, and then you increment it, and that's what you get. Okay, all right, and so then if you look at if you look at the expectation, right, and this is going to be, you know, lambda to the epsilon minus one times one over epsilon. You factor it out. So it doesn't it doesn't kill the integral or result or anything like that. But if you look at the expectation of that thing, then you would get, you know, lambda to the epsilon minus one, one over epsilon and y, and that q hat just integrates out to one. Okay, so so things work out nicely. So such so, so the the expectation is is simple. It, it doesn't involve convolutions of all different things. I mean you just it just sort of ends up being relatively simple. But you have to remember that you have you do you end up with that extra factor of lambda because you are, you're innovating from, from the baseline. Okay, so so that's what's gonna go into your Fran tree condition. Okay, so like, let's, let's call this like, um, VI, we don't need a plus in VI. So the expectation of VI of innovating on VI, okay, maybe we'll, we'll call that V bar, uh, is gonna be, you know, lambda or epsilon Y, okay? All right, so um, I think we're we're kind of short on time, but so so this this is going to go into your Fraunhofer condition, and basically your Fraunhofer condition is going to be gamma v bar is equal to w. That that's kind of all the same. Gamma is your probability of success, v bar is your your value of success, and w is that that opportunity cost. Okay, we know we know w actually. It's that's not too bad. Okay. We found that to be epsilon minus one over epsilon times Q. You can also write that as that epsilon power times Y over P, right? Because Y is Q times P. So Y over P is, is Q, right? And the reason that's, that's useful is one that gives you a Y to cancel out on the other side for V bar and has P, which is one minus R, which gives you something that's going to look a lot like those Fraunhofer conditions where we have sort of a discounted value thing and then sort of a one over one minus R kind of cost on the right. Okay, so so now it's starting to shape up to kind of look like what we saw before. It's just this this extra epsilons floating around and, and things like that. Okay, but the basic sort of logic and framework is similar. Okay, 
Um, yeah. Uh, okay. And so, 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 you know, and, and this is, you know, from here, it's just a matter of, you know, getting everything in terms of like a common equilibrium variable. So let's say it's R. Okay. So that's okay. So that, that right-hand side, the marginal cost side is we have that in terms of R, you know, then you just have to worry about, well, what's tau. Okay. Well, tau is just gamma times R. Okay. That is, is also the same, right? Because just you do innovation, maybe you're successful. That's it, right? That that's what goes into the free entry condition basically, right? So this, this determines free entry condition more or less, right? Um, Okay, so uh, that symbol, um, G, the growth rate is slightly more complicated. Okay, so G is Q dot over Q, right? Um, so, so in this case, all right, so, and remember, um, this is our Q. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so, I, and I guess I, I only have like five minutes officially. So what I'm going to do is I'll solve for G. Once you solve for G, it, you can, it's just a matter of plugging stuff in and, and solving and, and things kind of cancel in a nice way, but it, it's not a hundred, it's not super illuminating. I think most of the utility here is just knowing the sort of steps and the potential pitfalls. Uh, okay. But, but here I think it is useful to look at, at the growth rate because um, this is a slightly different setup from what, what we're used to, okay? Um, so here we have this Q aggregator. We want to find the growth rate of that, okay? Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the growth rate of Q to the epsilon minus one, okay? And then we know that the growth rate of Q, sorry, yeah, the growth rate of Q is the growth rate of Q to the epsilon minus one divided by epsilon minus one, right? So which is to say, you know, G of Q to the epsilon minus one is equal to epsilon minus one times G of Q, which is just G. Okay, so once we have the growth of Q to the epsilon minus one, it's just a matter of dividing at the end. Okay, so so that's not hard. It's just finding the, the growth of Q to the epsilon minus one. Well, okay, so what's that gonna look like? Um, so think about it like this. I'll write it like you know, Q to the epsilon minus one at T plus delta. Okay, well, it's gonna be that integral Right, and then basically, you know, you might have some innovation, okay? And if you have innovation, you're going to get boosted up by lambda. That was an attempt at an epsilon, which failed. Um, you get boosted up by lambda, uh, and if you don't, you're not going to get boosted up. All right. Yeah. Okay. So it's not that... I mean, it's, it's it's pretty similar. Okay, um, now uh, it's proportional though. So everything here has a QI attached to it. Okay. Both both of those terms have QIs attached to them. Okay, um, and then but once you factor out the QIs, then whatever is left over doesn't depend on I. Okay, so you, you still get sort of the the full separation. Um, and 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 what you're gonna get is um you know you'll so so the the non-i dependent stuff will be sort of like one plus delta tau times lambda the epsilon one is one is one. So if you fact I, I did a couple steps here, okay, but but basically because partially because I'm running out of time, basically you can factor out all that stuff. And then over here, you'll be left with just that standard integral. And I guess it, there, there should be up T's in there on the QIs, but I'm just, just going to drop this. Okay, so so you factor out the QIs, then you get, you're going to get like a, a delta tau lambda to the epsilon minus one plus one minus delta tau. And that's what we have here. We have delta tau lambda to the epsilon minus one plus one minus delta tau. I just kind of factored it differently. Okay, and then the thing you factor out that depends on Q is just this thing here, which we know is QI, you know, and this is, this is like of T, I guess this is, this is uh, Q epsilon minus one at T. Okay. So at T plus, 
you know, uh, this thing here. Times that thing at T as well. Okay, so. All right, and and then so okay, because then on the left hand side we have t plus delta. Okay, so subtract this, divide this, divide the delta, take a limit. Okay, um, right. Well, subtract this, divide the delta, and take a limit. That's your derivative. Okay, so d d t of q to the epsilon minus one. I guess just without the t. Um, is uh, tau yeah. okay and so then the growth rate is just that, that proportional term so g of q to the epsilon minus 1 is just that tau lambda of the epsilon minus 1 over epsilon okay um, and then the last step is you know log you know this this g function here acts like a log so pull out that epsilon minus one and divide it then you get g of q which we're just calling g is you know it's it's i guess one way to write it is like this lambda the epsilon minus one over minus one over epsilon minus one times tau okay so this is sort of lambda related term and then tau okay so that's that's how you do the growth rate for a for a some sort of power type aggregator, you know. Now, what does that lambda function look like? Any takers? I know that we've, we're, at the, we're, we're at the end of a long blog of algebra here, but that lambda function, actually, if you make lambda C and epsilon theta, that's CRA, right? And when you converge the theta equals one, or in this case, epsilon equals one, you converge to log. Okay, so this converges exactly to that epsilon equals one case, at least in terms of what the growth rate expression looks like, because you end up with a log there. Okay, so um, same, just, I don't know if it means anything, but it's the same sort of mathematical, you know, statement, right? Um, yeah, so so that's what you get. So now where do you go from here? Well, okay, so we know that tau is lambda times r. We know that g is this, you know, we, we could just call this, it's probably easier to just call this, again, just call this like lambda tilde, just lambda tilde, and then go from there because it's, it may not be useful to unpack it. Although actually it does cancel some stuff, but anyway, you know our, you know, you can find tau, you can find g, and then you plug that back in, you know, up here. Or rather, like, yeah, into v bar. Okay, you plug it in there, and then eventually you'll, you'll be able to solve something. Okay, um, I would go through that. Okay, what I found I can't make a 100% guarantee that this is correct. I believe this is correct. If you sort of plug everything in and simplify it, I believe you get this. Um, gamma. You get that. All right, it's a, you know, stuff cancels, but you have all the elements here, it's just algebra at this point, right? Um, so, but, but I, I would go through that just to, to, to see how it works. Um, and, um, yeah. So, but but the interesting thing is, and I'm I'm, I'm out of time, I'm over time here. But the interesting thing is, uh, well, you can solve it. Okay, that's cool. Um, you can you can find you know basically you can find the labor shares and the profit shares, and that just depends on epsilon. Okay, because epsilon determines how substitutable the goods are, which determines the level of profits, and then that the net of that determines the the labor share and everything. So, lambda uh, epsilon acts like lambda used to, right? And in fact, there's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence in how they act. Okay, um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is is well, lambda still shows up, right? It, it's still you know still you you're doing this sort of proportional incremental uh, innovation. Um, so so both epsilon and lambda are important. Uh, but but if even if you set lambda equal to one, that doesn't give you. So if you set epsilon equal to one, you get r equals one. That epsilon equals one profits explode. People are just like, yeah, let's do research, okay? Uh, because monopoly power is just extremely powerful, it's extremely strong. Um, if lambda goes to one, though, then you're going to get something. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be one, okay? You're going to get innovation, but lambda is one, 
Okay, so what that is, it's really just like jockeying for ownership of these product lines. You're not producing any growth. If lambda equals one, the growth rate is zero. This is one to something, which is one minus one, it's zero. But people are just doing innovation because they're just, it's just like churn, okay? They're just trying to steal product lines from each other. So it's very inefficient, okay? So you can see that there's, there's a, that you can see that potential for this inefficiently high level of research, okay? So it kind of depends on how you, like what you assume about uh, stuff like that um, in, in the background, but but at least as we set it up, you can get just this pure churn that just produce any growth. Okay, so that's that's kind of interesting, I think. Um, okay, so that that's pretty much it. That was, okay, let me just put that in context though. You know, I, I would give you, first of all, I'm, I, I would not give you a problem that's hard on an exam. This was more like, this is like the outer envelope of what you might expect on a problem, but it also kind of touched upon some different topics that I wanted to kind of go through. So I think it was useful, but it's, it's harder than a, an exam problem. Okay. Uh, but like hypothetically, you know, I, in, in analogous problems, I would tell you like, here's your Q aggregator. Exactly. It's this integral Q, Q I of the epsilon minus one, use this, go with this. And I'll try and be like, you're in the production side, you know, solve for this, take this as given, but, solve for the wage and solve for why or whatever. Um, and, and the usual sort of way that I kind of try and step through it. Um, so, but I would give you you and, and kind of constrain the path that you could take, right? So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that makes things a little bit easier, okay? It, it provides a, a course for you to, to, to go on. Um, but yeah, but overall, just like this, this is, this is definitely harder than an exam problem. That would give just because it's like there's all sorts of integrals flying around it and it's it's just a lot of steps, you know, it's kind of messy. So um yeah, that's 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 the context that I would put it in.